Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. I did a pulp job for a guy and uh, pulp is for the paper industry and I'd cut wood since I was probably 12 or 14 years old with my older brother and sometimes my dad dad worked away from the home so my brother and I had to cut wood a lot for firewood for the house and uh, so I figured I'd I could do it I knew how to cut wood and he comes after about day well the first he was gonna have his own cutters do it so they cut a half a day two or three cutters and I don't think he figured I would stick with it or do anything with you know a single horse and I had these girls father big so I went he told me what day they were done I could go start and I come about 1 30 over to his job site which was three or four miles away and I said I'm done and he goes hi you're quitting I said no I'm done everything's skidded out that you had cut and he goes huh I'll have to get you your own cutter so I think that shocked him so we did this pulp job and then pretty soon the cutter he got me quit because that was way too much work in that deep snow so I was doing my own cutting and skidding with a single horse and he come over and watch you one day and he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. He goes, I got to show you a few things before you kill yourself. So he introduced me to directional felling and bore cutting. And I understood it pretty good. I'm like, well, this is a lot better. This is a lot safer. It's way better than just how we'd done it, you know, way people had always done it, you know, with the back cut and the tree goes when it wants and all that. You had no control of the tree. So um, I finished that job that winter, didn't really make any money, decided right then you're not going to make any money doing pulp, which is small sticks for the paper industry, with a horse. You know, you just can't get enough cords out in a day. It was a learning experience. And I did a few other little jobs, mostly firewood jobs or cleaning up jobs. And then a year or so ago, I'm working for some of these people doing firewood jobs, and they said, you know, this is really excellent what you do with the horses. They said, you should advertise some. You could make a business and out of this. And I don't know, it was like a light bulb went off. You know, I could. And, the farming slows down some in the winter and the boys are getting bigger and Katrina's a very able-bodied woman and why couldn't I work off a little bit? So we advertised a little bit and I set up a booth, we had a banner made and I set up a booth at one of these grazing conferences because we're farmers and what I know is farmers and farmers often own a woodlot and I met these people here, Jim and Bonnie Jackson 
and uh, really nice people and they have a lot of woods on their farm. They have a 280 acre farm with something like 125 acres wooded and uh, they were interested in having some property horse logged along the edges of their fields for silvopasture. They want to, what they want to do along the edges of the fields is thin the woods out enough to establish some grass and clover in the woods and basically recreate a oak savanna so they have a place to graze their cattle on the really hot days. So when we get in here, you're going to see it. It's a pretty aggressive cut. Well, the reason being is we want to get down to around 20 trees to the acre so enough light gets in to establish some grass. And he has a lot of cleanup to do that he wants to do himself for cutting the tops up for firewood and burning the brush and stuff. And then he wants to establish some grass and clover and have spots to go with the cattle when it gets really hot to make them more comfortable in the shade. So this project right here, essentially starting with, is going to be working along the edges of his cropland, creating some silva pasture areas. So, because he keeps a lot of his cropland in you know regular pasture, and then on hot days he can graze in here. For almost 40 years, Rural Heritage Magazine has helped readers borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. The magazine is packed with stories and information about farming and logging with draft animal power, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. If you or someone you know wants to run a self-sufficient, diversified family farm, or just learn how to make a weekend hobby farm more productive, Rural Heritage Magazine is a smart choice. Articles cover a wide range of interesting and useful topics and are written by people living on the land doing the work they write about. A one-year subscription is $34.95 for six issues, 24% off the newsstand price. Sign up for two years and save even more. Order online at www.ruralheritage.com or by calling 319-362-3027. That's www.ruralheritage.com or 319-362-3027. This is a thinning job, but it's a pretty aggressive thinning for, to establish silver pasture, and their oak is very mature. Um, they have some oak that's not mature, but they have a lot of mature oaks in there that are really ready to go. When you, when you fell them, the bottom few feet are starting to get hollow. I mean, they're as, big, they're as good as they're ever going to be. Um, so anyways, yeah. So we started creating this business to fill in the winter months. The boys are getting bigger. I think I mentioned that. They can help their mother on the farm enough, and I get her set up enough, so I come over here and work three or four days, five days maybe, then I go home for three or four days and get everything caught up on the farm. It's a nice supplemental income. Um, most of the infrastructure, we already cut 15 to 20 cords a year for the farm, so we have saws. We have a stock trailer for the farm. We have a truck. We obviously have the workhorses for the farm. Um, all we added, and we were wanting it for all the firewood we cut anyways, it was the hydraulic forwarder. Um, I had the logging arch for some jobs I'd done around home. I just skidded all the wood. And uh, so we didn't add a lot of infrastructure. And, and you know, the horses, they go into spring then. They go into spring for field work. They're rock hard because they've been working on and off throughout the winter. Um, it's not bad for my health either. I'm, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work. I mean, right now there's hardly much snow, but when that snow is deep, knee deep, it's hard work and it pulls the pollens off you and keeps you in shape and um, looking young and beautiful and everything. And it's, it's good for you. So when you hire a horse logger, it's like hiring someone that can work in a garden. They're saying, go out and pick the ripe ones. If you hire a large processor, what they're really good at, and ideally for them, it's like hiring someone to say the alfalfa field's ready, go cut the whole alfalfa field. The processors can just, they're unbelievable how much timber they can cut in a day and how much ground they can cover. But they like to cut everything and get a lot of cords out to pay for that $400,000 machine. Where with me, with one, two, or three horses, I can maneuver in their woods and go snatch them mature oaks. More like a, a person going in a garden, you only pick the red tomatoes. You don't go wipe out the entire garden. So I think that's the difference between a, a, a large footprint and a small footprint with the horses is I can, I can go sneak in and cut what they want to cut. I write in my contracts that they're in control. I, I work, I don't buy any timber. I work as a service, basically. They can stop me at any time. I write that in the contract. So if they're not happy, I'm done. In this area, the yellow popple saws out to really nice boards, really nice lumber. It's better than even, it's a lot better than white popple. The red oak, I would suspect in this area, since they had me cut it all eight foot eight, that they'll saw their slab wood off to get their logs squared up some, and then they'll saw really nice boards, number ones, number two boards, really nice boards, until they get down to a seven by nine inch tie, and they'll sell that for the railroad industry. It'll go to a creosote mill and become a creosote railroad tie. And uh, there's a lot of that here, and that's with the cant. The cant is the center of the log. It's generally the weakest part of the log. Um, 
that's what's good use for that cant is a uh, you know, in, in smaller logs, they make 4x4s, 4x6s, 6x6s. In this oak, they like to make a 7x9 railroad tie or an 8x8 railroad tie. Describe to me a typical day from morning until you go to bed. Usually I get up at 5.30, which is two hours later than my wife, I might add, who at home gets up at 3.30 to get milking done in time for the kids for school and everything. So I get up at 5.30, which is sleeping in, and I, uh, I start making breakfast in the tent and uh, servicing saws if they need to be clean, bars flipped, sharpened, get them ready to go, mix up whatever. By then, breakfast is ready. Um, I say a morning prayer, I eat my breakfast, and then I come out and feed the horses, and the horses are eating. I'm kind of getting stuff ready out here, gassing up the forager, um, checking stuff over, and then the horses get done eating, I start grooming and harnessing horses. Unless I have no wood on the ground, I might leave the horses alone and take my my backpack and my saws and gas and oil and wedges and go cut for three four hours and get a bunch of wood on the ground and then harness the horses at noon and maybe only use them a half a day. If I have a bunch of wood on the ground I might harness the horses right away in the morning and go skid that wood out and give them a long lunch and go cut a little more or decide I have it all picked up and not harness them for the day and go cut all afternoon. But it usually being alone it's about three four hours cutting to four or five hours skidding and landing. I'm not a very fast cutter. I, I go real slow and careful, and but that's what I'm getting paid to do. Is it lonely? Yeah, it is. Um, for a family guy, it's it's tough. Uh, it's you start you know by like Wednesday, you're talking to your horses a lot more. You know, you don't have your your kids. But it's good. It's it's kind of like bow hunting, but bow hunting's three hours, and this might be four days. But it's some good alone time. It just gets to be a lot of alone time. You get to go home tomorrow. Yeah, go home tomorrow. And that's the end of this job for this year. I, I, I worked five weeks here this year, about three to four days a week. And they've already told me they're hiring me back next year. So I'll give them a month or so a year and then go on. I have another job that starts next week up in Minnesota. And I'm going to give them about a month a year. And then I have a job closer to home, 18 miles from home in Rib Lake. That should be just a one-year job. Um, and I've had multiple calls. I had one actually in front of you last night from a county worker, a county official that is cousins to these folks and seen on Facebook, I guess. One of the relatives here posted on Facebook the horse logging. He loved it and he wants me to look at his property by Gilman. You know, it, we'll see. We'll see, you know, if it fits. But uh, I had lots of calls. I'm probably booked out about two years now. And I'm to the point already that I can turn away work or take work and whether or not I think it'll fit for the horses or if I'm their best choice, basically. If somebody um, already had horses and they were using them kind of as a hobby at home and they were thinking about maybe doing some work in their own woods or even maybe for a neighbor's woods or something, w would you feel comfortable giving them any kind of advice? What would you tell them? <sighs> horses, even the best ones. I know I had nodded towards mine. Any horse, even the best ones, are powerful. And, and they can be dangerous and they have a mind of their own. And in, on field equipment, you have the field equipment and a big wide open spot. In the woods here, you have dangers from above, dangers from below, dangers from behind, dangers from the side. You better be rock solid with your relationship with your horse. It might be worth a drive one day to go, you know, if, he'll, if he would let you and you contact him first, to drive one day and go watch Tim Carroll or just watch Taylor Johnson or watch me you know, or some of these guys have a lot more experience with me, and just watch and let them show you how many things can go wrong and how quickly, and make sure that you're at that level. Because you don't start math class in algebra. You start math class with one plus one. And, and I would say the woods is exponentially more dangerous than field work. I did field work for 10 years with horses, and I probably skidded a little firewood right away, and I was shocked, even with that slow, big 100% Brabant. He was a slow walker and powerful how fast stuff could come around on you and pinch you or, or catch a stump and flick at you. or And he minded. He, he was good, and it's still dangerous. So you better be rock solid with your horse and, and maybe drive. Take the day and drive and go watch somebody and, and let them explain more in, in, in person. You need a, a, cha a log chain with a grab hook and a slip hook and a, a single tree. And preferably on the single tree, they make these, they sell them, at least around me, the co-ops and harvest stores. They sell this grab hook with a pin through it. Put that grab hook with a pin through it on your single tree, and the slowest a horse one year past retirement, the slowest, calmest, 
best broke horse you can acquire that listens to you and that you two are totally rock solid in your relationship and just go skid wood. And now be aware, just skidding little wood, little wood's light. So you're skidding it along and it hits a little stump you didn't cut off low enough and it flips right up like a pole, bar, pole vault and whacks you in the back of the head. And at the very least, you're very sore and maybe worse. You, 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 have, you know, so anything could still go wrong. There's a lot of stuff moving in the woods. You know, it, it could happen to me today. And that's hence why I said the morning prayer and the evening prayer, like I said. That's just stuff moving with a 1,500, 2,000 pound animal with tremendous power pulling on it. And you could see it happen one split second before it happens and say, whoa, and it still might not be soon enough. I almost tipped that over twice last year, the, the logging arch. And you get that wheel a foot or two up in the air, that wool better be instant on them horses. And you'll see in the video, like, I might make some modifications to that Wallenstein log loader and get a platform to stand up on because I stand in between the forecart and the wall and scene and work um, and load my logs. And boy, I wouldn't do that if you, if you didn't trust them horses 100%. I don't know if I'd do that even in the summertime with ground bees and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's dangerous. It's, maybe that's a part of the attraction to it is not everybody can do it. You know, because you want to, maybe it's better if you just go watch a few days a year. It's not, I'm never going to be a ballerina. I realize that at my size and my, I'm never going to be a ballerina. I could say I love ballet, but I'm never going to be a ballerina. Maybe not everybody can do it, but you can still go appreciate it. Or if you have a wood lot, hire it, you know, but there's a lot of people that could do it at various degrees. Yeah. There's a lot of people that could. Do you enjoy the, the working in the woods part of it? Yeah, the I do. Woods? Yeah. I like it. I enjoy my horses and I enjoy the woods. I was always a hunter. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of it. You know, 20 years ago, before I had a family, I probably wouldn't even be lonely. I, I used to love just being alone and hunting. Now I got a family, so it's sometimes a little harder by day three and four. You just want to pack up and go home and stuff, but I love it. So I have that area over there opened up quite a bit. And I'm looking at this area right in here, this 50, 60 yard area, and I haven't taken much out of it. So I was thinking maybe this lone tree here, it's a, pretty much the dominant tree in this area taking this one out to let some light in here for the silva pasture. Um, that three-way oak, obviously uh, that's not ideal, but they have a lot more growing to do. That twin oak, that, that double there, that could, I could take out this more mature side, but I think I'll start with this mature oak here in the center. I'm gonna have to, have to look at this closer, which way I wanna flop it. If I go to the east, I'm going to have to take out one or two of these little scrubby white oaks. You can see they're never going to be anything. They're so crooked. That would open it up a little more. I could flop it to the east. And get underneath it, see which way it wants to go. It would like to go east. Full of what we call low hazards, ground hazards, waiting to trip you. Them all have to be cleared. Okay, without taking them out first, north is out of the question. I could go that way. That would require some wedging and lift it over. I think them white oaks are junk. I think I'll take them out and I think I'll go east. So that's the decision I'll make. So I'll start with my low hazards and my white oaks. And then we'll do a bore cut directional felling. So it'll be a few minutes here. For a high hazard, you got a dead limb right above your head. It's attached, you know, hopefully it stays attached 10 more minutes. But it's definitely a high hazard. You know, the other day with all these other trees, that could have got rattled real good. That could be hanging on by a thread right now, and you not even know it. But I'm going to try to cut this tree down and not get hit by any dead limbs. I think I've mentioned before, I got a beautiful wife, and it wouldn't take her long to get remarried. So, you got to be careful. <laughs> Come around and finish my face cut. 
a big old mature oak like this and you see that belled out stump. When you do that bore cut, you need to be paying attention that that wood was solid all the way through. If you're bore cutting in, it's you have a hollow tree. Now some of your rules just went out the window because you don't have good wood with good integrity. So even during your pork bore cut, you have to be using all your senses all the time. This is not a place to be thinking about the fight with the wife or thinking about bills. Your mind has to be right here, right now in the present. So I set my hinge on this side. I did probably 70% of my bore cut. I left more than 10% of a latch because I, I don't want to be to 10% yet. I'm gonna go around there and set my hinge thickness on the other side, do most of that bore cut. I'm gonna come over here. This is gonna be my escape route, so I'm gonna come over here and finish releasing the latch to let it go. The reason I'm having to do bore cuts from both sides is I didn't put the 32 inch bar on and I'm dealing with much bigger wood than a 20 inch bar. So I'm having to do it from both sides. <laughs> Now I'm going to set a couple wedges. If this is your pivot point, the longer the lever, the more torque you have. The shorter the lever, the less torque you have, but the more you, the more motion you have. So if this is your hinge point, that's your pivot point. The closer you keep your wedge to it, the less lift you have, but the more distance you lift, but you have less power. The farther you move back from the hinge point, the more power you have, because you just now created a longer handle to lift with, but uh, you lift it less distance. step I took before I took a step was lock that saw then I started going so that one's just hanging right above me <laughs> excuse me but it's down this program is available for purchase to order your copy please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.com RuralHeritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.RuralHeritage.com.